Planning Planning will go ahead and get started. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Spencer Whitney. He's visiting us from basically his summertime. I thought he was coming for spring, but I guess not. Uh, but anyway, he'll be giving a seminar this afternoon. I'll give a more formal introduction. Um, but he put together a lecture for his students. And, uh, welcome. Thanks, Bob. And thanks to you guys for turning up on a uh, cold morning. First, first day of the week as well, I must say, in Australia, we'd be lucky to have uh, any students turn up this early. And if it's uh, snowing, definitely not. So as Bob says, I uh, run a research group in Australia. And uh, I suppose, uh, as you'll find out from this lecture, the enzyme which I study is called Rubisco. It's, it's pretty much my academic obsession. And I've been studying it since my, um, since my honours, actually. So uh, there you go. So my group for, is part of this uh, um, uh, entity called the uh, Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Translational Photosynthesis. And uh, now the point is not working. Anyway, we'll just uh, go on. So what I want to talk to you today about is uh, photosynthesis. So I don't know how many of you, you know, study plant sciences or even know what photosynthesis is. So for this lecture, I'm just going to go back to some basics so that you can actually get a, a basic understanding of the process and why um, I study or my group studies what we do and why there's actually a, a large international uh, or growing interest in actually studying it. Because as we know, the ultimate game in agriculture is to improve productivity and throughout the, the last you know, 100 or so years, there's been various advances uh, in uh, processing, um, machinery and also biotechnology advances which have enabled us to improve uh, yield and uh, or productivity of crops. You know, most of the biotechnology is, uh, is focused on um, pest resistance and uh, uh, you know, like herbicides and pests. So this is uh, you know, a big uh, challenge throughout the world, you know, global food security. In Australia, it's not an issue, you know, it's because we still export 30% of our grain. So the government doesn't actually recognise food security as a big issue. But on a global sense, uh, it is. And I suppose the reason why we're concerned is that if you actually look at Australia, uh, most of our country is... Oh. It's going everywhere, but where I want it. Anyway, you can see that most of Australia is actually desert. What we have down here is on the fringes of the coast and around the base here, that's where our productive areas are. Most of it is desert. And so even in a small country like Australia, where we've only got about 25 million people, is that we're gonna actually end up needing to produce more food in uh, more arid environments. And we already do. Um, where I'm located is here in Canberra where that little red dot is. And has anyone been to Australia? Yeah. So you probably know that uh, Sydney's, oh, God, I don't know how to use this thing, uh, is well, very close to us and so is Melbourne. So if you want to go to Australia, you want to go to a capital city, go to Melbourne, it's the best. That's where I grew up. How big is Australia? Just sort of put this into context. Here's the uh, state of Kentucky. You need 75 of those states to actually fill the same area as Australia. So. So as we all know, global uh, population is increasing, you know, at a, a fairly steady rate. And back in the 60s, we had the Green Revolution. So this is where essentially the dwarfing gene in uh, a lot of uh, crops, grain crops. So you could actually uh, get more production in terms of the grain with less invested in the straw. So you have shorter stature crops. And that actually helped uh, 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 society keep up with the demands. But what I'm just trying to show here, and as I say in the second line of this uh, um, text, is that you know for us to be able to reach, uh, you know, maintain the um, the required grain consumption of the growing population, we need to actually have improvements in productivity in the range of two to three percent per year. At the moment, we're lucky to, in most of these crops to be to match one percent. So what that means is we need a step change in our productivity. So a number of years ago, back in about 2007, we proposed that this could actually come about by improving photosynthesis. And, uh, and we call this the second golden revolution so that we could get funded. So again, as you'll see in the notes, that uh, this uh, Megan Clark, who's the CEO of uh, Australia's chief scientific um, body called CSIRO, um, that in the next 50 years, 
the, the, uh, the global population need to produce more food than we've consumed in the whole history of humankind. So that's quite a, uh, a daunting statement and it's really good in that it gets the, attracts the attention of our funders as well. So if we go back to our grade eight, nine uh, equation for photosynthesis, we take CO2, we take water, and we can produce oxygen and sugars. Okay, so these are, these are free inputs. And of course, that is what supports life on Earth. You know, without photosynthesis, we wouldn't have the, uh, the environment which we have, we wouldn't be able to breathe and all that sort of thing. So two key components as well are light, because that's what uh, um, we capture that energy to use to drive this uh, reaction uh, process. And of course, arguably the most important enzyme in this whole process is the CO2 fixing enzyme called Rubisco. So it sort of joins this, the inorganic and the organic phases of the global carbon cycle. So what I want to talk about today is I'm just going to go through some of the basic principles about photosynthesis, go on about the, so you have an understanding of what Rubisco is, its diversity, how do we actually engineer Rubisco in plants, and some of the recent um, breakthroughs and also some of the challenges faced in, in these sort of uh, bioengineering endeavours. So again, just so that you are on track that if we look through the, a cell in a leaf and we can see that around the outside are these uh, chloroplasts. And so they're located obviously on the periphery of the cell, so therefore they maximise both light capture and also exchange of CO2 coming in from the, the air spaces within the leaf. And this is just one of these great uh, pictures that uh, I think NASA actually put out, which is just showing you with regard to, so inside the chloroplast, we have all these stacked um, uh, membranes, which are called phylicoids, and they're stacked into grana. And that's where all the light capture and reactions of photosynthesis occur. And it's this liquid phase around those membranes, which is called the stroma. That's where the carbon fixation reactions occur. And this is just showing you how, you know, of all the light which hits the leaves, it's actually some of it's used to drive uh, chemical reactions and produce energy. Some's reflected as fluorescence, some's emitted as heat. And again, it just depends on, you know, how intense the light is, uh, how much of these, each of these reactions uh, occur. So here we have, the photosynthesis, again, it's just split into two, re uh, two reactions. So we've got the light capture. That's the conversion of light energy into chemical energy. And of course, the byproduct of that, thankfully, is oxygen. And then we have the carbon fixation side of things, which again, I make Rubisco a very prominent uh, component of that because that's the fixation of carbon to produce the sugars, which then uh, yield biomass and you know, essentially growth. Uh, what I just wanted to point out here is, so these chloroplast, these is just a cross section through a tobacco leaf. So we here have one of these cells, all these little white dots are chloroplasts. So in one tobacco uh, leaf cell, you'd probably have about 100 chloroplasts, 10 to 100 chloroplasts. And here's all the intracellular air spaces. So of course the CO2 concentration within a leaf in most plants is actually uh, less than what it is in the atmosphere because it's got to go through a few different um, uh, passageways, just trying to think of a simpler term. Um, so therefore the CO2 concentration around Rubisco is a lot less than what it is out in the atmosphere because of all these uh, resistances. So therefore plants need to regulate the stomatal open so to allow enough CO2 in, but again, there's always a cost because you have water being lost. So for every CO2 fix, say in a wheat plant, you, for every CO2 fix, you actually lose about a thousand molecules of water. So this is called the transpiration ratio. So we actually target Rubisco uh, in terms of, as you'll hear, it's, uh, it's considered an inefficient enzyme. So we're trying to actually improve its uh, carboxylation properties so that ultimately they can actually fix carbon dioxide at lower intracellular CO2 concentrations, enabling the plant to actually reduce its stomatal aperture and reduce water loss. Or we can actually ramp up the efficiency of Rubisco so plants don't have to make as much. So therefore, as Rubisco comprises about 25% of a leaf nitrogen, you can actually reduce the energy of uh, the nitrogen costs. So you improve nitrogen use efficiency. So just so that you can uh, uh, have an understanding, basic understanding of how the light reactions and the, and the carbon fixation reactions are joined, this is just one of those um, you know, textbook diagrams showing the light harvesting uh, protein complexes 
which are, are integral membrane proteins, and they're located in the thylakoid membrane. So they're these, those uh, membranes shown here in this um, chloroplast. Um, and what happens in this whole process is that as uh, leaves capture light energy in the chlorophyll molecules or the carotenoids, their passage to a pair of chlorophyll molecules in these uh, reaction centres. I'm going to try and get this to work, sorry. No, it doesn't want to work. Okay, and it induces electron transfer. So when these chlorophylls uh, absorb this, uh, this light energy, they get excited and they emit uh, uh, an electron. And that starts a cascade of electron transfer events. So all these protein complexes are doing is they're holding these, uh, um, these molecules, which just simply transfer this electron from one molecule to another. But during this process, we get uh, an electron deficient um, uh, reaction center in this PS2, which is photosystem two. And ultimately the electrons are then come from water through the oxidation of water to produce this oxygen. So the, the final product of this whole electron transfer reaction as I've tried to show here is the production of NADPH through the reduction of ferrodoxin and ferrodoxin NADP reductase. But during this process, we see that there are protons which are pumped from the stroma, that's that soluble uh, phase, into the thylakoid lumen. So we get this acidification of the luminal space. And this is actually a, a, um, a proton um, uh, um, used as a translocon um, proton pump, which drives the synthesis of ATP synthase. So it's a bit like in mitochondria in the matrix, they also have ATP synthase. So the ultimate other product of these light reactions, electron transfer, proton pumping into the lumen is a production of ATP. And the electrons, again, as I say, which are, um, you know, replace those which are lost during this process come from the oxidation of water. So the products of the light reactions are oxygen and the energy. This is just a, to show you if you actually just take half of that photosystem uh, two complex, and this is what the protein looks like. And if we actually strip away uh, the surface, we can actually start to see that within these protein macromolecular complexes are where they actually position all the chlorophyll and the carotenoid molecules such that they can capture energy and then funnel it towards just this one reaction center chlorophylls. They're the ones shown in red there, okay? So it's a highly efficient process of the energy hitting each of these molecules. The, the amount of energy received by those you know, reaction center chlorophylls is around about 95 to 99%. So it's really efficient. So that's all the photosystems are, just proteins organizing molecules so that you can maximize light capture. <sighs> so, what you'll see is I'll actually draw it in this other way, uh, more simplified version so that uh, the outcome is that during this electron transfer process, we get the production of NADPH it's for reducing power, production of oxygen through the oxidation of water, a proton gradient which produces ATP, okay? I just sort of put down, these are sort of like the three major uh, uh, projects which have uh, looked at enhancing, trying to enhance photosynthesis by engineering the light reactions. And I just put them up just to give you a contrast about the amount of effort which is actually looking at uh, changing the light reactions as there is to, compared to changing the carbon fixation reactions. So the carbon fixation reactions, they occur in the Calvin cycle. And uh, you know, this is back in oh, 60s. It was when you, no, no, Bob, 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 Bob wasn't a researcher then. And these occur within the stroma. So the Calvin cycle is, uh, uh, you know, the bigger target. So it actually contains three phases. So the carboxylation phase, that just involves one enzyme. So that's what that little one in the brackets means. And that's fixed by, the, that's um, um, uh, catalyzed by the enzyme Rubisco, which we're going to talk about. So it fixes carbon dioxide onto this five carbon AEBP substrate, rubulose 1,5-bisphosphate and to produce these two identical molecules of 3 phosphoglyceric acid. During the regeneration, of the, sorry, the reduction phase, this is the, probably the energy expensive phase where these two three carbon molecules are then uh, modified to two other three carbon uh, molecules, but these are actually the triose phosphates. So this is the starting, the building block of sugar synthesis. Essentially, it's like half a sugar molecule. And that involves those two enzymes. Now, in the more uh, uh, 
the larger part of this cycle actually involves another nine enzymes. And that's just in the regeneration phase. Because of these, uh, you know, each of these glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecules which are made, for every six that are made, five are reused to make more AEBP and only one goes to producing sugars on average. So you can see that you need to go through this cycle three times. So fix three CO2 molecules and two, you can actually produce one three carbon triisphosphate for uh, sugar production. So overall then, it's a very energy costly process. And of course that then goes on to build, yield and sustain um, productivity. And again, so the energy requirements of this whole process are then driven by um, uh, uh, the light reaction supply. But it also makes the rubisco, as I said, it's like the gatekeeper for joining the inorganic, the organic phases of the global carbon cycle. So essentially every carbon molecule in your body has been through an active site of rubisco. So the rate of photosynthesis and plant growth is often limited by rubisco activity. And the question is, why is that? And that, that's sort of the, the context of the rest of the, um, the lecture. So what is rubisco? I've given you a bit of an idea. It's a carboxylase enzyme. So within uh, nature, there's a, a number of different structures. As you can see on the top, these, uh, these are the hexadecameric. So the 16 subunit forms of rubisco is called form one. And they're the ones which we're primarily interested in because they're found in plants, algae, and cyanobacteria, and various other proteobacteria. So they contain actually two types of subunits. Large subunits, which we'll talk about in a second, and small subunits, which arrange at the top and the bottom of the uh, in tetrads. Then we have form two rubisco. So they can actually take on a number of different structural forms, L2, L6, L8, and they're found in uh, certain uh, bacteria, and also dinoflagellate algae. So that was what my PhD was about, um, identifying uh, this form of rubisco, which doesn't have small subunits. But generally, they're considered to be um, uh, less um, productive or poorer enzymes relative to the form ones. They may have higher CO2 turnover rates, but they have very low affinities for the substrate. And then, of course, we also find rubisco in archaea. And again, it can form various different structures. Um, so. Anyway, it seems to have lost the thing. Anyway, but what is conserved in all of those different rubisco forms, although they form different oligomeric uh, forms, if you actually look, the simplest structural unit is a dimer of large subunits. And if you actually take the 35 or 36 uh, crystal structures of all these different rubiscos and you superimpose their active site, they're all superimposable. There's very little change in the orientation and positioning of all the uh, active site residues, which are uh, fully conserved. So as I said, uh, for form one rubisco, it actually contains two subunits, has a large subunit, about 477 amino acids. It has an N domain and a C domain. And uh, you can see that these catalytic residues shown here are actually dispersed throughout the, the primary structure. It's only when it's folded into a, a, um, a quaternary structure that they're all in close association to form this catalytic pocket. And you can see that there's a couple of amino acids in the N domain uh, which are also associated with the active site, but they actually come from the partner large subunit because the large is arranged head to tail. So in this catalytic pocket, you know, uh, two amino acids from this end domain and many from the C domain of the other form, the catalytic site. Then we have the, uh, the small subunit, which is about a third of the size, and uh, um, it actually doesn't have any amino acids that are directly uh, associated with the catalytic pocket. But as we now know, the small subunits have a really strong influence on the catalytic properties anyway. So the final structure, as I said, is a hexadecama where we have eight large subunits. So there's an octameric core of, or, or tetramer of um, large subunit dimers. And then we have the small subunits on the top and the bottom, which sort of act like a cement in a, in a, a brick to maintain the structure in a, um, an active form. So this is just a little uh, movie just to sort of put this into context. So this is just one large subunit, and um, luckily we're not playing the music which goes with it. So within the large subunit, as I said, we have a, a N domain, uh, which is down here. Then we have a C domain, which contains uh, the, the main catalytic pocket. So that's actually shown there, that little stick figure there, that's the substrate AEBP bound. And then we have 
The two, another large submit come along, which is arranged inverted, so that then we actually get the uh, residues from its end domain being part of that catalytic pocket as well. We assemble four of these uh, dimers and we form this octameric core. We can see it's actually hollow. And on the top and the bottom is where the small subunits bind to form this stable and active complex. If you don't have the large subunits there, the enzyme is, uh, has little or no activity and is structurally unstable. So, just wanted to point out that, um, you know, we say Rubisco catalyzes, you know, the carboxylation of RUVP. And I just wanted to point out that this uh, uh, chemistry is not that simple. Rubisco actually does it via five partial reactions where we have the CO2 addition after binding in the active site. The AVP forms an ene dial, which can then be attacked by C carbon dioxide at the C2 position. Then you have a series of hydration, uh, protonation, deprotonation reactions to give those final products of 3PGA. And they're used in photosynthesis. Now this reaction actually evolved, you know, two and a half, three billion years ago, when back then the CO2 levels in the atmosphere were extremely high. There was no oxygen. Um, and so it was ideal, the reaction was fine. But then oxygen evolved in photosynthesis evolved. And unfortunately, oxygen actually turned out to be a competitive inhibitor of CO2 because um, they share very similar um, uh, structures. So the oxygenation reaction, however, it still produces one molecule of 3PGA and still binds, that oxygen competes for CO2 for binding for the ene dial but it actually produces this other product, 2-phosphoglycolate, and that's actually toxic to the plant. So therefore, plants and you know, photosynthetic organisms have evolved a, a process called uh, photorespiration to actually recycle those two molecules, those 2-phosphoglycolate molecules back into 3PGA. But that costs energy, and it also ends up with the emission of CO2. So this is why it's um, considered a, a, a non-ideal pathway. Um, such that so in a plant like wheat, around 30% of the carbon that's fixed in photosynthesis is actually lost through photorespiration. The goal of our research then, if we just simplify this, we have the Calvin cycle linked to the light reactions through the dependency on energy. Obviously, the carboxylation reaction of Rubisco doesn't consume energy or require energy. Um, so our aim is to increase the flux through Rubisco carboxylation to uh, increase flux through the Calvin cycle and reduce the flux through this photorespiratory pathway. So, of course, some plants and uh, algae have already done this by uh, evolving carbon concentrating mechanisms. And you can actually, as we've seen a little bit, actually, no, you won't, that's this afternoon, you can actually grow plants under high CO2 and you can stimulate growth as well. So, the question is is it feasible? Can we alter the, the carboxylation properties of Rubisco? And just to give you an idea of how many studies, this is just uh, in the last few years, um, a lot of work has been focused on increasing flux through the Calvin cycle. There's a couple of enzymes in there, which are, um, if you stimulate their activity, you can actually increase the rate of ABP regeneration. There's uh, lots of studies trying to increase CO2 around the side of Rubisco using various artificial means and trying to emulate what the nature's done. And there's people like myself and my group who are actually just totally focused on engineering Rubisco itself. So why is um, Rubisco considered inefficient? Well, because in addition to the reaction I just showed you, Rubisco actually undergoes catalytic misfire reactions. So it can actually produce some molecules which inhibit the enzyme. And that's why Rubisco, I'm not going to talk about today, has a, a chiropractor for a uh, another enzyme called Rubisco activase, which helps alleviate and remove those inhibitors from the active site. Um, it has actually a relatively low specificity for CO2 over O2. I mean, if you read articles, they say you have a specificity of 80, but that's when you've got equal concentrations of CO2 and O2. Now in atmosphere, we don't have equal levels of CO2 and O2. So that's why, you know, under ambient conditions, it's... Um, uh, photorespiration is such an issue. And it has a relatively slow turnover rate. In the literature, there are lots of papers saying, but Rubisco, there's lots of enzymes with such slow turnover rates. Rubisco is not unusual. Unfortunately, those enzymes aren't produced at the same levels as Rubisco is there. You know, 
sub percentage, whereas Rubisco, as I say here, it's, it's around about 30 to 50% of their soluble protein. So as I said, you know, whenever you eat a bowl of salad, you're killing a lot of Rubisco. And when you import, when I import uh, protein Rubisco into the state for some uh, groups, you know, I just put on the, the customs, you know, what is the kind of, this is the most abundant protein in your salad, you know, so anyway. So of course, Rubisco has three substrates. It has IEVP, has oxygen and CO2. Now, it doesn't actually bind either of the gas substrates. All Rubisco is is just a scaffold to bind IEVP, tweak it to, into a formation so it can be attacked by either of those two gases and preferentially by CO2 more than oxygen. So when you measure the kinetic parameters of Rubisco, these are the, the, uh, the six main ones you, uh, you, you consider. So essentially it's, it's speed for oxygenation and carboxylation, so K-cat turnover rate. It's apparent affinity for CO2 and O2. It's specificity for CO2 over O2. And also the, uh, it's affinity for the substrate IEBP. Now in uh, plants, IEBP concentrations are extremely high. So generally we don't really consider you know, measuring the KM for IEBP. So the main parameters which we uh, analyze when we sort of analyzing our rubisco so we analyze their structure then we analyze their function so their kinetic properties and then we try and draw correlations to identify patterns um, so we only measure uh, primarily these four parameters and the reason why we do that and I just want to point out speed is not everything if you read the literature people are putting in faster enzymes into plants faster rubiscos but the compromise is that they have very low affinities for CO2 so if you have a low affinity and a high speed, it doesn't matter. You're going to, you have actually got a poorer enzyme with regard to most the physiology of most leaves. C4 would be different, but uh, unless you have a CO2 concentrating mechanism. So for those of you, has anyone done leaf gas exchange measurements, measured photosynthesis, anything like that? So on the y-axis here, we just have photosynthetic rate. So it goes up as we increase the CO2 concentration inside the leaf pretty straightforward but it's not a linear curve it's sort of linear at the start and then it starts to taper off and back in the 1980s a lady named Susanna von Kammerer was working with a guy named Graham Farquhar uh, during her PhD and they're both mathematicians and physicists and what they did is they, they, they took what we knew about photosynthesis and the biochemistry and they started to work out equations to describe these curves and so they can simply be modelled or simulated using these equations. And I don't want you to you know, memorize them, I just want you to take into account that most of the parameters here are all associated with Rubisco. So this is why this part of the curve under limiting CO2 concentrations, photosynthesis is determined by the kinetics and the content of Rubisco. Of course, then we hit this other region of the curve when it starts to taper off, and that's when the photosynthesis is limited primarily by the rate of electron transfer, the rate at which those light reactions can generate enough energy to support flux through the Calvin cycle. So that's either called the electron transport rate limited or AEVP regeneration limited, depending on who the lab and the author is of the paper. But what you will see is that also influencing this is the Rubisco specificity, okay? And that's got to do with the fact that you've got that photorespiration occurring. So if you actually improve or increase your specificity, you actually have lower rates of photorespiration. So the energy which is otherwise being used to go through, you know, fuel that photorespiratory cycle, there's less demand for it. So more of that energy can actually be used for photosynthetic gain. So if you improve the specificity, that curve would actually go up. And this is just to show you, this is quite old actually, this, is, this paper actually Bob and I wrote many years ago, um, just a, a brief, but we just wanted to point out that this is just form one type Rubisco, there's huge amounts of catalytic variability in nature. So Rubisco has evolved and has adapted, but maybe not as fast as what it could be, could have, and later today I'll talk about reasons for that and maybe I'll touch on it now. So... What we have found out, and this is sort of what drove me back in 2001, I was sitting there going, well, why are we doing this? You know, I keep getting asked from the audience, you know, if, if Rubisco could be improved, nature would have done it. And then luckily I started to look in red algae, and sure enough, they were exactly right, nature had done it. 
So if we took the rubisco from some red algae, their kinetic properties outperform all vascular plant ones. And if we could actually get that to fold and function properly within a tobacco leaf, we actually see these great improvements in its catalytic efficiency and photosynthesis over all the CO2 range. And so the people who do all this modelling at uh, leaf and canopy level um, uh, proposed that it would actually improve photosynthesis by about, on um, plant growth actually, not photosynthesis, by about 30%. As you'll see, it's, yeah, I'll get back onto that. So that's sort of, uh, we'd already started, but we've been continuing on this. Uh, so how do we actually uh, identify solutions for improving catalytic uh, variability? Um, so the way to do it is just to screen nature. If there is that variability in nature, let's try and get that information, that structural information, and then the function information. So in other words, it's catalytic forms. Identify potential residues important for that, and then test it. So that's all well and good. This has been done. A lot of bioinformatics people say, oh, these residues are under positive selection, and all that's great, but they actually miss the point that some of those are under positive selection, not for catalytic reasons, but for complementarity for the folding machinery within the plant, which again, I'll talk about later today. But, so what I want to talk to you about is how do we actually go about testing the performance of these rubiscos? So if we actually look within a, a, a plant, we actually see that the large subunit is coded within the chloroplast genome. And the small subunit is usually a multi-gene family, all coded in the nucleus. Okay, this is in vascular plants. In algae, it's different. In algae, the large and the small are still both in the chloroplast genome. So the larges are made in the chloroplast, form these octameric cores. The smalls are made in the cytosol, transported in, transit peptide, N-terminal targeting peptides removed, and we get our L8, S8. This is the simplistic uh, version of it. It's actually more complicated than that. So when we go to engineer rubisco, we actually target engineering of the large subunit gene in the chloroplast genome. So this means we do it by a process called chloroplast transformation. So that's what I'm just going to quickly go through now about uh, what's this process. So just in case you don't realise, the first genome sequence in plants was actually the chloroplast genome from tobacco back in 1986. The old way, P32 gels. Oh, God. Good fun. So um, the chloroplast genome, as you probably realise, uh, the chloroplast was actually a photosynthetic endosymbiont and its genome has been reduced over the years, so it's a prokaryotic origin. So a lot of the features of the chloroplast genome have the same sort of regulatory elements as you would find in E. coli, for example. Um, divides, chloroplast divides by binary fission, in other words, it's independent cell division. Uh, genomes you know, contain uh, four regions, large single copy regions, two duplicated regions called inverted repeats and a small, and that's sort of associated with their division, uh, mode of division. And what's really nice is that the plastome is actually maternally inherited, so therefore it's not uh, found in the pollen, so therefore chloroplast uh, engineering has been um, sold by many as being uh, um, free of outcrossing. So genetically stable and um, not transmitted. And, and of course, what it codes is many of the components of its translational machinery, but also most of the proteins involved in those photosynthet uh, photosynthetic complexes, particularly in the light reaction. So all those big membrane complexes, about half of them are coded in the chloroplast genome, half in the nucleus. So there's got to be this coordination uh, um, crosstalk between you know, when these protein complexes have been assembled. But we don't have time to go for that. But most importantly, the large subunit gene is coded in the chloroplast. So when we want to transform it, the, the beauty of chloroplast transformation is that it occurs by homologous recombination. Okay, so that means it's a directed event. We know what the genome sequence is going to be even before we start the experiment. And uh, it also means that we only need to generate one plant. We don't need to by nuclear transformation, you generate lots and have to screen exhaustively. So the simple process is take the region which you want to uh, play around with, clone it into an E. coli vector, and you have to have these flanking sequences. So they're the ones shown there with the red stars, because then that's what then directs your transgene reintegration into the chloroplast genome. So in this case, it's just putting in a different RBCL, you transform it in, and you undergo um, 
uh, homologous recombination, and then you get a new transformed genome, which is actually coding a different large subunit. What I've omitted there is that you have to have a selectable marker, like all other transformations. But again, in chloroplast transformation, we can get rid of that marker, so we can have a, a fairly uh, um, well marker-free chloroplast genome as well. And the reason what we do, sorry, the species which we do all this work is tobacco, 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 tobacco. It was where Pau Malaga first derived this system in plants, and uh, it's uh, the most amenable and most established and most efficient um, uh, tool or plant for this sort of process to do these sort of studies. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we've generated many different genotypes um, to study, to do these uh, um, rubisco mutagenic studies. So the simple concept is that once we've introduced the foreign RBCL, so this first paper back in plant physiology, we put in the sunflower, we produced a hybrid rubisco, so therefore it's made up of sunflower large subunits and the tobacco small subunits. But what we found is the catalytic properties of this enzyme was the same as sunflower rubisco. So therefore that was telling us that the large subunits have a, a very strong influence on the catalytic properties. But it's not an easy process. So from our biolistic, this is where we coat the DNA we want to transform onto particles, gold or tungsten, shoot it into the plant. We get our regenerating plant, we screen. This is just the, the system we use. A lot of people do uh, southern blots. We just do um, uh, native page gels, polyacrylamide gels, grow the plants. Then we have the advantage here is that we can actually analyze the enzyme itself but also we can analyze the photosynthetic properties and then correlate the two, okay? So it is a good system, but it can take time. It can take three to 12 months. If the plant is viable, it's three months. If it's not viable, then it can be 12 months to six years because you can only grow the plants. So if you knock out rubisco, for example, you can grow the plant in tissue culture, but it's bleached and it's, uh, yeah, it doesn't grow very well. So that also means that we can actually, even if we totally impair rubisco's activity by whatever we introduce, we can still generate transformed plants. So this just to give you an example of a paper we published in PNAS a couple of years ago, where what we looked at is a, a, a family, a genus called Flavaria, and they had a whole different range of uh, um, C3, C4 species. So that's just the different C4 plants can actually concentrate CO2 around rubisco. And what they do is then is they have slightly different kinetics. So here they, they generally have faster enzymes. But when you looked at the large subunit from all these different species, there was actually like uh, 12 different Flavaria species, and looked at their large subunit, they're almost exactly the same except for three amino acids. And so what we decided to do is we decided to use chloroplast transformation to actually identify which one of those amino acid changes was responsible for this uh, improvement in K-cap. So we go from you know, about three to four here. And so we made a whole variety of plants and it actually showed that there was this one amino acid change from isoleucine to a methionine would actually uh, change the kinetic properties of the rubisco. So this is the first example that we could actually use chloroplast transformation to find catalytic switches, which is really good. And it was a great proof of concept. The only challenge is though that in plants like tobacco, they already code isoleucine 309, and it's not a C4 kinetic plant. So therefore, there's no silver bullet for these things, these studies, which is pretty troublesome. But uh, for certainly yeah, a whole range of different genus, that is a catalytic switch. So one thing which we decided to do a number of years ago is we said, well, tobacco is the model plant for doing chloroplast transformation. You know, how well can we use it to uh, do testing of other mutagenic solutions and other crop rubiscos? Is it a good surrogate? Because in most of these plants, chloroplast transformation is not established. So what we found is when we substituted the large subunit in tobacco with all the large subunit of all these different species, we actually saw all different growth phenotypes. Some grew normally, like this one here, expressing potato large subunit. And... Uh, and, and some grew very, very poorly, such as this one here, expressing a Arabidopsis. And so, any ideas why they all grew differently? Yep. Yeah, that's, that's actually, could be a good point, because if the activase isn't compatible, then you can't regulate the enzyme. 
And that's, yeah, that is, that is the case in a couple of other plants, which I'm not going to talk about. In, in this case, it's because the, uh, the folding and assembly requirements of those large subunits weren't uh, compatible with the, uh, the folding machinery in tobacco. And so what we did is we then, if you actually looked at the large subunit sequence and start with tobacco and then uh, draw a phylogenetic tree of similarity closest to the tobacco large subunit, and then you compare it with the amount of rubisco which is produced in each of those leaves, we saw a really strong correlation that the further you got away from the sequence homology to the tobacco large, the less amount of rubisco you got. And in actual fact, as you can see down here, we got uh, in these monocot species, you get no rubisco produced. So the ones coated in orange, we saw no production, which is a bit of a pain because they're the ones, they're the maize, they're the wheat, they're the rice, they're the ones we really want to work out how do we improve. So what are the breakthroughs? What are the challenges? So before I showed you a very simplified version of Rubisco assembly, large made in the chloroplast and forms an L8SA, small made in the cytosol comes in and assembles. Well, it's not quite that simple. All the way through the, the uh, processing of the large through its translation to association with a, a bunch of chaperones which maintain it in a, um, an unfolded state, not a misfolded, feeds it to the the chaperone and folding cages. And then what's been unknown for a number of years um, is what happens after that. And it turns out that Rubisco has four specific chaperone proteins. They're specific for Rubisco. And, uh, and they're required to actually fold and assemble these, uh, uh, maintain Rubisco in the dimers to form these optimers to then enable small subunit uh, assembly. You can also say even during the small subunit processing, it's also in constant association with chaperones to make sure it stays in an a, um, a unfolded state that can be delivered through the translocon complexes. And Bob's probably going to annihilate me because they haven't actually shown all the post-translational modifications that also occurred, which is what Bob has discovered. <clears throat> so what we did a number of years ago is we actually uh, we identified this by just comparing the phylogenetic tree of large subunit sequences and their RAF1. So there's a paper which came out of Cornell from David Stern's lab, identifying this Rubisco assembly factor as critical. And that sort of said, well, hold on, it looked like they're exactly phylogenetic, same phylogenetic trees. And so then we thought, well, obviously they've co-evolved and uh, uh, evolved in parallel. So therefore, is there some complementary complementarity requirement there? So what we did again is we just made another tobacco line which is producing a Arabidopsis uh, large subunits, and that's called this tobacco ATL line. And then we made another one where we also included its complementary RAF1. So if you look at the RAF1 sequence of tobacco and Arabidopsis, they only show about 60% amino acid identity. And sure enough, what we saw is that the plants grew a lot quicker. And when you actually go and see the reason for this is that they actually, you get more of that Arabidopsis large subunit being out of the fold and assembled into functional rubisco. So what that means is that rubisco during its evolution and even now actually is dependent on compatibility with all its partners. It's got so many uh, proteins which are associated with its uh, assembly. And again, I'll talk about that this afternoon. But just to quickly uh, show the proof of the pudding is that a paper just came out last year in science, the the, the um, first co-author is actually an ex-student of mine. I didn't realise they were doing this because we're doing exactly the same thing. So, but what they showed is uh, you could take the, the genes coding all those different uh, chaperone components and the large and the small subunit from Arabidopsis, express it in E. coli, and lo and behold, you can actually get functional assembly of plant rubisco. This has been uh, a challenge for the last probably 30, 35 years that you you can always get the large and small subunits made, but they're misfolded insoluble aggregates. What they also showed in this really nice study is that if you actually emitted any one of these components, you actually didn't get any rubisco assembled, except for that one RBCX. If you left that out, you still got rubisco assembled, but less of it. So, so that was really nice work. So that's about it. I just want to summarize um, what we've gone over what I wanted you to sort of take home is that first of all, that the light and the dark reactions work in you know, unison together, it's sort of understandable. The energy required to drive the Calvin cycle is, uh, comes from the light reactions. 
um, that Rovisco is uh, it's critical in that it links the inorganic and organic phases of the, the global carbon cycle. There are other CO2 fixing enzymes in nature, but uh, they usually they can't uh, work in the presence of oxygen. So that's what makes uh, Rubisco unique. Um, Rubisco, the ones which we're interested in is, uh, uh, is a hexadecameric structure. Uh, it's kinetics and, and it's content, but we don't really want to put, if you put more Rubisco in a plant, we've done it, you can put 15% more Rubisco into tobacco, has no effect on growth. All they do is they just shut down a little bit more Rubisco. Um, and that, you know, plant rubisco is not the pinnacle of evolution. There are more efficient versions out there. And if you come to today's lecture, you'll hear about how we've actually engineered more efficient uh, versions using in E. coli. Uh, uh, the process in which we engineer it, we use chloroplast transformation. It's a targeted event. Tobacco is our, our model plant. We're now moving into canola there though. And uh, it's been really useful. I just gave you a few examples of identifying catalytic switches in the large subunit. And that, uh, you know, the new breakthrough, or well, we've sort of known this for a while and it's great that someone's finally showed it because we, we wrote this in a paper I wrote with one of my students back in 2008 proposing that Rubisco evolution has been constrained by this requirement for complementarity with its folding chaperones and a lot of people said hoo-ha. And then this latest paper showed that it is. Um, and that offers actually now, as you can imagine, offers us a new tool which we can actually engineer. Do we have to go through the chloroplast? Can we actually use E. coli as a surrogate chloroplast now? So, uh, which is why we're doing that. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you. So they have uh, 10 to 100 copies per chloroplast. So if you have 10 to 100 chloroplasts per cell, you've got up to 10,000 copies per cell, which is why they're, it's, they're very abundant. So you've got one nuclear copy and you've got 10,000 copies of the RBCL sort of thing. So So yeah, so how do you, um, I mean, this is the reason why people said this will never work, because if you've got 10,000 copies per cell and you've got to get every one of those copies transformed, um, and then of course within the, you know, that's just one cell, then you've got the whole leaf around that. So, you know, back in the 80s, they were saying to Paul Malaga, who'd worked 15 years on this, well, it's not going to work. You're not going to get every um, chloroplast transformed. And I don't actually know, you, you know, People ask me this question, and always, if Ralph Box in there, I always get him to answer it. But to me, it's still black magic. You have to maintain the selection pressure. So, therefore, there's some obvious some advantage to having the selectable marker in there, which is the AADA gene, amino glycoside um, uh, producing enzyme. So, uh, yeah, you have to maintain that selection. And you have to make sure the plant is homoplasmic before you take it off that selection, because if it's not, it'll revert back to wild type. So, yeah. Yeah, so so they can divide independent of cell division. Um but it's, I mean, you just reminded me of something else. So there's actually communication between chloroplasts, which occur by these things called stromules. So they're, they're very transient. So people actually question whether or not there's that sort of communication of genetic material between chloroplast copies. Um, the suggestion that it's not the dominating factor is because they did micro injections years ago, a guy named Neil Day in Manchester. And so he did micro injections just into one chloroplast with a GFP, and then he followed the uh, the spread of that GFP, and it only ever went to just a few chloroplasts either side, and then that was it. Then it was actually lost. So it's probably not the sole 
mechanism of you know uh, making sure every genome um, but uh, I suppose that comes back to chloroplast transformation in plant species is fairly easy okay so they've transformed rice wheat and even maize chloroplasts so they know that the challenge is actually getting homoplasmic plants so it comes down to the tissue culture is the biggest thing so with tobacco you can get a plant from just one cell and you can get it easily but that's not the case for most other plant and crop tissue culturing processes you can't in Marcantia, obviously but uh, yeah any other questions yep You mean photorespiration or? Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it varies depending on the temperature, how much wind there is, you know, the boundary layer effect and all those sort of things. So whenever you do a leaf gas exchange analysis, um, what that does is because they use infrared gas analyzers, they just measure the greenhouse gases and the two are CO2 and water. So all they're doing is they're just measuring the rate of CO2. So they measure the water and the CO2 content and the line going into the chamber and the line coming out. Um, so it, it does that the transpiration ratio varies depending on the vapor pressure difference. So again, as you, you're on the right track, if, if, you, uh, if you have it, the humidity too high, yeah, it, uh, you actually see uh, an opening of the, the stomata. I always get this around the wrong way. Anyway, and so therefore your, your ratio actually decreases, okay? Um, but again, that ratio, that humidity in the chamber actually, if you look at the equations which determine mesophyll conductance, so it's sort of like stomatal conductance, actually depends on that, uh, that water value as well, how much the humidity in the chamber as well. So yeah, that's probably explained really poorly, but that's not my uh, area of expertise. But from first principles, you'd say that if a leaf is in a humid atmosphere, it can probably um, uh, open its stomata more because you're gonna reduce water loss if the humidity water vapor out content outside the leaf is you know, higher than normal. No. So, I, again, I just put up, although I said catalytic speed is not everything, I just used that as an example just to show, look, we can speed up Rubisco by putting in these switches. But accompanying that increase in KCAT is a reduction in CO2 affinity. So when you actually look at the effectiveness of those enzymes, they're exactly the same within a C because their carboxylation efficiency is pretty much the same. And that... Those equations which I showed you, that first one is simply, you, could, you just take a Michaela's Metten equation and you can actually see it's exactly the same equation. So that means the initial slope of that reaction is dependent on the catalytic efficiency of the enzyme. So in this case, the carboxylation efficiency. Um, yeah. And so before catalytic turnover rate becomes critically important, where you might see, start to see an advantage, you actually have the IEVP, the light limited rates of photosynthesis cut in so therefore, so again, this is why I say a faster enzyme is not always a better enzyme. But having said that, if we could put corn rubisco into tobacco, it would, according to the, the simulations, it would actually improve photosynthesis because it's got a, a twofold higher K cap and it's got a lower CO2 affinity, but it's not you know, reduced such that it's, so in other words, it's got a better carboxylation efficiency than tobacco. So. Yeah. 
Well, that's a lot of work's been done by Ron Milo in Israel and Tobias Erb at Max Planck Institute. And so they've, uh, you know, there's a great paper which came out in Science uh, 2017, where yeah, they're engineering synthetic CO2 fixing pathways and putting them in e into E. coli, or uh, the one which Tobias did was more an in vitro system. Um, and it, as I say, that's elegant research, but biological significance zero. So uh, yeah, at this point, I always say at this point, um, so we, we need to make sure we keep supporting that type of research. I call it blue sky research, but we wouldn't be anywhere where we are now if people weren't doing that type of research. So uh, Tobias is really disturbed by the fact that, you know, we, uh, the photosynthesis uh, fraternity haven't actually, you know, mentioned much about his research. And I, and I suppose it's, you know, if you actually look at that, look at the, the biochemistry of what he's done, and he, he sells his work by saying it's the faster, it's more efficient CO2 fixation than Rubisco. But then you look at some of the KMs of the enzymes which they've engineered, and the KMs for their substrates are uh, enormous. So in biological context, it won't work, and it'll only work in a synthetic setting. So they've got to work on those sort of aspects. And of course, if you're not a biochemist, you don't pick up on that until you actually look at their kinetic table of their enzymes and go, well, that's ridiculous. You know, that's almost, you know, that's super saturating. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you've got to keep doing this type of research. It's, it's pretty exciting. So, I, yeah, Ron Milo actually collaborated